Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So thank you all for coming. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, welcome Jared Saya, I think I'm saying that properly, right. uh, to Microsoft <laughs> Research. And uh, I haven't prepared an elaborate uh, introduction, so I will let him tell you all about uh, building a computer out of the Internet. Jared? Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, so. I'm Jared Saya. This is um, joint work with uh, Valerie King um, at the University of Victoria, Vishal Samalani, who is a, um, a former student of mine who's at the University of Waterloo right now, and as a postdoc, and um, Eric Fee, who's at IBM Labs. And uh, both Valerie and Vishal are actually going to be at um, Microsoft Research in uh, Silicon Valley next year. All right. So the, in this talk, I'm going to be describing some sort of a, a broad framework that, that um, encompasses some past research that we have done and also a lot of areas for, for future work. And I'm very, I guess I should say at the outset, I'm very interested in uh, getting feedback from um, a, a more systems audience here. This is one of the first times that I've, I've given this talk. Uh, since the second, I'm sorry, the second or third time I've given this talk. So, please, um, if you're, if you have any uh, feedback or questions, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, the outline for the talk is: first, I'm going to describe sort of a, a vision um, that that we have of trying to build a computer out of the internet, and I'm going to motivate this uh, vision, and then give some more details of exactly. What types of uh, of computers I want to we want to build out of the internet, and then I will give some of the details of um, uh, the preliminary work that we've done in um, in to knowing how to in deciding and figure, in proving how we can build these computers, and finally I'll I'll wrap up with um, some ideas for future work. <clears throat> so the basic idea of um, our research is to create a what we call a net computer out of the internet. Um, the inputs of this computer are simply drawn from the individual peers in the internet, and the outputs of the computer are basically sent to the peers in the, the network. And the components of this net computer are composed of the individual peers in the network. <coughs> so. As part of this vision, we're just looking at a at a peer-to-peer -peer model. Where we're to start with, we assume that the um, the network is uh, homogenous. Um, we don't we want to avoid having uh, a um, a server or a collection of servers just for for reasons of uh, of scalability. And so, Essentially, we'll, we'll be assuming that all of the peers will um, contribute not only inputs but also resources to this, this net computer. And um, the, um, the access to the, the net computer will, will we envision as, as basically being free of, of charge. Um, so if you contribute resources, um, you're able to access the, uh, the net computer freely. Um, and we're going to make use of um, an overlay network uh, in building the net computers, as I'll go and I'll go into the details of this um, later on in the talk. But essentially, this will just be um, a network whose topology we get to control um, that connects the, the peers in the peer-to-peer -peer network. <clears throat> so here's some motivation for this uh, this. Um, vision. Um, so why would you want to create a computer out of the internet? Well, first thing is to create brand new applications. So uh, 
that you know wouldn't you wouldn't really be uh, available unless you you had something of this type. So first would be uh, robust uh, distributed file systems. Um, so that it, in particular, I, I would uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say these these applications are brand new, but um, the newness of of these applications. So the, the, the novelty that we want to provide is basically to um, um, create these applications that in such a way that they are um, robust to an attack. Okay. So I, I should really say this, create new al create applications that are robust to an attack. Um, so robust file systems, uh, voting systems, collaborative filtering systems, auctions, and uh, um, techniques for enforcing mechanisms like uh, um, uh, mechanisms that, that are used for an auction, for example. And we want to create these applications by uh, making use of the, the resources such as bandwidth and um, uh, memory and uh, CPU um, and user knowledge and so forth that's available in the individual peers in the network. Okay, so that's one of the things. Um, going along sort of similar lines to this, uh, we would like to be able to to fight fire with fire. So by that, I mean that um, the black hat community uh, right now is making use of whether we like it or not. They're they're making use of the uh, vast amount of resources that are available in the internet. They're actually like tapping those resources to create things like like zombie nets um, in order to to attack the internet. So. Our feeling about this is that in order for us to have a chance to deal with these types of attacks that the black hat community is launching, we need to, to make use of the same tools that, that they're making use of. Okay. So um, some of the, the things that we'd, we'd like to do uh, here in order to, to, um, to fight fire with fire is basically to come up with these come up with a, a design a net computer which will enable us to do distributed detection of um, of things like spam and and worms and I'll, I'll get into more of the details of that later on in the talk and then um, finally there are some applications that have been around for a very very long time like uh, BGP that we would like to increase the security of we'd, we'd like to make these systems robust to attack and again, this, this falls under this very broad vision we have of, of, uh, of creating um, a, a net computer. This, this is something that a, a net computer would um, potentially be able to, to help out with. So th that's our vision, and it's a, it's a very large vision, and we have only really just started on it. Um, so uh, let me emphasize that again. That you know, this is something that I, I'm not claiming that we have been able, we've actually been able to do yet. Um, we have. I, what I can claim, however, is that we have been able to make some preliminary steps. In doing it. Okay, so there are two major problems to creating a computer out of the internet. Um, the first one is is uh, the problem of scalability. Um, if we really want to use all of the resources that are available on, on the internet, um, we have this huge scalability problem because um, you know, the, the protocols that, that we design, we would like them to be able to scale to up to, to millions of, of peers, basically. Um, and in order to do that, the resource cost for each of the peers must be very small in N, uh, the number of peers in the network. And by very small, to start out with, we're basically trying to, to make all of the major resource costs um, polylogarithmic in N. And uh, that is essentially just logged to some, um, some constant exponent. And eventually, uh, we would like, we envision something where we could get the resource cost down perhaps even, even smaller than that in some case, in case it's the important resources. Okay, so by, by these resource costs, I mean Things like the number of messages each each peer needs to send out, the latency of the algorithms, um, the number of, of links that every peer needs to maintain um, in the overlay network, so forth. Okay, so that's that's one of the big problems. And then the second uh, 
problem that I think is just as, as important as, as that one is that the internet is under attack. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I need to convince anyone anymore, really, that the internet is no longer a, a friendly place. Um, there are all kinds of motivations for attacking systems that we might try to build of this type, um, ranging from, you know, economic reasons, uh, political reasons, um, to, uh, you know, just um, the sheer joy of trying to, to, uh, to destroy something. So anything that we build has to be uh, robust to um, a significant attack. So these are the two major problems here. And because of those two problems, our, our, um, our goal is basically one that um, stated with these two problems in mind. So we want to design this net computer, which consists of both algorithms and an overlay network, and we want it to be both scalable and robust to attack. <clears throat> OK. So um, for me to, to say that the system, for anyone to say that their system is, is robust to an, to an attack, they need to have some sort of attack model. Right? So um, this is our, our attack model. We have a, a fairly strong model of attack that, that we're using. Um, we basically assume that there's this adversary that controls a certain fraction of the peers in the network. Um, so we'll be assuming that it's that fraction is strictly less than than one third throughout the this talk. Um, we further assume that this adversary is omniscient, so it, it knows our algorithms and it knows the structure of the the overlay network. Um, and based on this information that it has, it can carefully choose which peers it takes over. I'm sorry. Dynamically? Uh, not dynamically. So. There, I, when I talk about the future work, I, I will talk about making the attack harder. But the, the work that I'm going to discuss um, today, the preliminary work, um, is just a, a static attack. Um, good question. Uh, so let's see. There's one other thing I wanted to say about this. Um, because we assume that an adversary is, is controlling these peers, we're, we're making this very... I guess sort of pessimistic assumption. You know, we're 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 assuming that the, the the peers that are controlled by the adversary are basically clairvoyant. They can all communicate amongst themselves. Um, so I, I, I want to um, emphasize that we're we're making an assumption which is probably a little bit stronger than what really w would be the case in under certain under many types of attacks, perhaps in 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 that. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, to call the peers that are controlled by the adversary corrupt, and the remaining peers are, um, are correct. And all the protocols that I discussed today um, will, will be assuming that they're only followed by the, the peers that are correct. And the corrupt peers are actively trying to subvert our protocols. Yeah. So the adversary can pick up any peer and decide, I want him, or it's just there are a thir less than a third of them and that are vulnerable? So are all of them vulnerable, but just the adversary for some reason doesn't want to take over more than a third, or just less than a third are vulnerable, and of those, the adversary can take over any of those that they want? It's the first thing that you said. So all, all of them are vulnerable. The adversary gets to, to, to choose one third fraction of them to take over. Why and the adversary take more? Um, well, They're all vulnerable. we simply can't. Uh, we, cannot, we have no guarantees in the case where the adversary takes over more. So the, so the, the, guarantee, the guarantees that I'm going to give you for these algorithms will be where the adversary takes over up to a third. But for example, I mean, if you have a system where the adversary is taking over more than a majority of the peers in the system, if you, if you think about it, you, there are certain things that you can no longer do. Like you can't do any sort of majority voting or something like that. Yeah, I understand why it's handy to not, to not allow him to take over more than a third. I, w I want to know. Why does this seem realistic? If, if everybody's vulnerable, it, it's a form. It's, it's a formalism of, of the assumption. Basically, the assumption is no more than a third will be vulnerable, will be taken over. But the adversary gets to choose which third. Yeah, the reason we're asking this question is that we ask the same question in person. In some sense, if your model in the internet is that 
all the machines are equally vulnerable, then saying, well, we're going to assume this less than third is sort of like saying we're going to solve the problem by looking at the street lamp, right? I mean, because we happen to have a solution that works for, for cases where there are, you know, the fraction is less than a third. Your point is well taken. I mean, I, I would really love to be able to stand in front of you and say that I, the system can tolerate up to 99% of the oh, peers yeah. be taken over. But I simply can't do that. I mean, it, it's... There, there are actually there there are actually some some uh, lower bounds that are that are known for for simple problems like Byzantine agreement. You know that you can't. Well, I'm just saying maybe a better model would be that less than a third are vulnerable, so the adversary can't even take the. Uh, the, the then the adversary seems more realistic. But th this is even, even stronger. Than that. uh, that's true. which third are yes. vulnerable is chosen by the adversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's true. So 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 yeah, I mean if if you. If you wanted to look at a, at a stronger attack model where um, you know you could tolerate up to 99% of the peers being taken over by the adversary, you would have to it would have to be weaker than this attack model along some 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 axis. I mean, you would have to assume the adversary was you'd have to assume something some some weakening of the power of the adversary definitely. All right, but this is what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, Okay, so there's a huge amount of related work um, in this this area of um, designing these scalable and, and attack resistant um, systems, and uh, many people in this this room have done work in this. I, I know I've read some of your work. Um, so, in the area of peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, I'm just going to focus on um, attack resistant. Results. So by that I mean, um, uh, well, actually, there's even there are even more papers that I've listed here. But there there are a lot of um, results for peer based systems which are um, robust to uh, Byzantine attack, and I, I believe there's some some work in the Farsight group that's been done on on that as well, right? Um, the specific thing that. Um, that is, I guess, most closely related to the stuff I'm going to talk about today is um, designing uh, uh, distributed hash tables that are robust to an attack of the type that I just described in the previous slide. And the results that I, the most recent results that I know on this are, um, there's a result by um, Amos Fiat and, and myself and one of my students um, in ESSA, and a result by um, Auerbach and Scheidler um, that, that, um, that builds on that. Which basically describes a um, a distributed hash table, which is robust under under uh, not just this type of an attack, but also an attack where um, uh, the adversarial peers are joining and leaving the network. So it's a, it's a dynamic type of attack. So that's that's sort of the state of the art for attack resistant DHTs that that I in the theory community that I know. Um, but um, an important thing that I want to point out is that. A distributed hash table enables secure communication. And communication is not the same thing as, as computation. In the same, th same way that a, a data structure is not the same thing as, as, a, as a computer or an algorithm. So just being able to have this, this um, secure and scalable distributed hash table is not really fulfilling our vision of the net computer, you know, a, a, a computer that can um, actually, you know, do do sort of computation, not just uh, communication between the components of the computer. Okay, so another area of, of work is that that does deal with with uh, scalable computation is is grid computing, and the main strategies that I've seen um, for grid computing uh, systems are to use um, cryptography in order to register users. And these schemes, I think, work very well for this domain of grid computing, where the number of legitimate users is typically um, considered to be in the, the the thousands. So you know, a, a system where there's there's sign a, a um, you know medium number of, of scientists um, basically that are that are going to be using the grid computing system. There's there's that, and then there of course are, are these systems like SETI at home and Folding at home, where there's a very large number of um, home computers that are participating um, 
in what is arguably, I guess, a, a grid computing system. But the, the people that are specifying the computation to be done, there is just, I mean, there's just basically one sort of legitimate um, uh, entity that is, is um, farming out um, the work to these, these um, computers. So these, the type of work that's been done in grid computing is not really um, in alignment with our um, vision of sort of an open to masses uh, system where the inputs to the net computer can basically come from you know, all of the peers in the network and um, the number of, of, uh, of users that we, we imagine using the system is something that could be in the millions. And then finally, um, there's a very mature and um, very uh, beautiful area of um, secure multi-party computation in the um, cryptography community. And um, you know, one of the sort of breakthrough results is this um, 93 result um, by Kennedy and Goldberg and I don't know, I'm not sure which basically says that you can compute any function in a distributed setting and in, a, and in an attack resistant manner where the attack is, is the, the, um, the attack model that I put up um, in the, uh, at the beginning of this, near the beginning of this talk. Um, however, the results in this area are not scalable to the best of our knowledge. Um, essentially, in order to, uh, to get this result, um, you are required to have each node in the network send and receive a, a number of message which is, which is linear in the number of nodes in the network. So this doesn't scale to the case where the number of nodes in the network is millions, for example. And there has been, of course, a, a lot of work that's, that's built on this um, and improved it in terms of um, you know, the resource costs and, uh, and simplicity and so forth. But it's still the case that that uh, that the the number of, of uh, messages that each node is required to send and and, and process is is linear in the number of the network, even for the, the very best results. Okay, so the initial fo focus of this uh, that we've had for this uh, vision of designing these these net computers is just to focus on designing special purpose net computers. And uh, the first thing we decided to do was to design these special purpose net computers, uh, one for each of the following problems. So first is Byzantine agreement. Uh, second is frequently occurring strings problem. And uh, the third is, is the spectral decomposition problem. And I'll talk about all of these um, later. The only one so the, the one that I'm going to discuss um, preliminary results for is the Byzantine agreement problem. And that's the, the results that I'm going to discuss will be a um, sort of a, a brief sketch of the results that we have in, in our SOTA and, and FOX paper, which, which are available online if you're, if you're interested in the details. Okay, so first let me, let me talk about the problems. Um, for the Byzantine agreement problem, you know, really famous problem, uh, each one of the, the pairs in the network is assumed to start out with a, a single bit, and the output that we need is for each pair to, to um, output a single bit at the end, and we need, to, um, have, we need to fulfill these following two constraints um, on the, the bits that are output. First of all, we need to make sure that um, uh, output of, of all of the, the correct peers in the network is the same. And secondly, we need to um, make sure that the output of all the correct peers is the same as the input of one of the correct peers. So it would be very easy to fulfill this constraint, for example, if we didn't have the second constraint, because we could just uh, have each peer output the bit zero, and we could just have that hardwired. So it, it, the problem only becomes interesting if you if you um, require both constraints to be fulfilled at the same time. So this is a uh, you know, really classical problem in 
distributed computing and in computer science in general. Um, why did we want to start out with this? Well, it's the, uh, the sine qua non of reliable distributed computing. In some sense, it's the simplest problem that we know how to formulate that if we can't solve it, then there's really not much hope for solving many of the other more complicated problems and, and interesting problems in, in distributed computing. Um, and this is also, this problem is used as a building block in many real world systems. Um, or at least uh, it is um, claimed to be used as a building block in many real world systems in, in many papers that I've read. Um, so database systems, uh, file systems such as OceanStore and, and Pond, I guess now is, is the system they're, um, they're putting from this. And uh, Farsight, I believe, um, I had this as a, as a component of it. Uh, multiprocessor computation and um, fault diagnosis systems. And also this is a very well studied and well understood problem. There's, I guess, three decades of work at least now that have been done on, on this problem, both in the theoretical community and, and um, in implementations. Okay, so the, the next uh, problem that, uh, that I just want to describe before I go, go into the details of um, our preliminary work is uh, the frequently occurring strings problem. And for this problem, this is a new problem that we, we formulated. Um, each of the peers, we assume, starts with a, a set of elements. Um, each, each element is a string. That is the input. And the output is basically to have each peer uh, learn, or in some sense receive as output, um, the strings which occur on a large number of other nodes. And large is something that um, will be a parameter of the system, how, how sensitive we want things to be. Um, the applications we envision for a net computer which can solve this problem is things like distributed spam detection and distributed worm detection. Um, the strings we basically envision as things like um, fingerprints of um, substrings of, of uh, um, packets or emails. So as in, so these are three systems that are basically for worm detection, early bird, um, autograph, and, and polygraph. I think one of these three at least was developed at here, right? Am I right? Yes, or, or some Microsoft? No, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, and as, as far as spam detection systems go, um, there are some commercial systems out there that do distributed spam detection that I'm aware of, but I, I don't know of, of any um, academic papers that have been written on them, so I'm not sure exactly, you know, so it's, it's hard to find out exactly how they work. But I certainly could imagine that, that this kind of, being able to solve this problem would be a very useful component for a, a distributed spam detection type system. Now, remember, this is the thing that the net computer that we're designing to solve this problem is something that we envision being both um, uh, robust to attack and scalable. So that's that's the novelty here. I, I, the the system would not just be scalable like, like I think already people have specified systems for these these um, in 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 the paper. These systems are already, I believe, uh, have this distributed component, which is, which is, uh, which is scalable, but they are not attack resistant. So, the the net computer we want to design would provide both of those, this, both that, the attack resistance and scalability. Yeah. Does each peer choose the strings, or are the strings signed by some trusted authority? Um, so so basically, we'd like each peer. So the good peers would would. Um, be submitting as inputs to the net computer the strings that they have seen from their packets. The bad peers, of course, could just be submitting you know whatever so strings they want to. Use this to subvert privacy to find out. Uh, I have a string and I'm curious whether he's got it on his machine. Uh, you know, the I voted for for such and such. Uh, can I? Could I? Could I, are you worried about those kinds of attacks? Y yes. Yes, we we are. Um, I mean, at, at this point, we haven't. So we've we've basically been looking um, mostly at the attack resistance and scalability 
components of the of the, the problem. But privacy clearly is is an important issue. For things like you know spam detection, I mean, for the preliminary stages, we were just think we basically were imagining a system where um, it, it's only sort of spam messages that are being submitted. Um, so if you're a good peer, you would only submit digests digests of messages that you had already um, that someone had sort of manually you know clicked on and said this is spam. Now for for things like um, I'm a bad peer and I, I have this email that I want to find out if you've sent uh, an email saying you know I hereby vote for so and so for president of this organization, uh, and I farm this out and find out whether your computer has that in your email. Well, so okay, if the if the good peers are only submitting spam. Okay. Then, then the thing that we're imagining getting back from this from the net computer is basically just those messages, th those spam messages that have been received by a large number of computers. Uh, yeah. You have received. You only get output if it was submitted as input from a good peer. Wait a minute. This is going to be used to build a system that detects spam, but you assume that the input you've already detected is spam. Well, that, so you assume that there's there's a certain number of people that have already marked the the message as spam. Say, I mean, maybe this has been done automatically or something, but. The, it's a large number so that nobody can mark a good message as spam. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Right, so, so you would need to have this, right, so that you need this large number. I mean, this by, one of the things that you would need for this number is it would have to be larger than the, the number of, of, uh, of bad peers in the network, for example, because then there would be that type of attack they could launch. So that certainly would have to be one of the, the properties. Um, and then the, to the issue with your problem, I mean, if you're, so we believe that you can actually design something first that, that is useful even without sort of these privacy concerns if people just submit messages they believe are spam. So they, you wouldn't be able to figure out messages that other people had. I mean, this is, this is how some of the commercial distributed spam detection systems work, I believe. Um, I mean, there, it's, ideally we would like to you know, be able to address these privacy issues as well, and you know, maybe you could make the system better by being able to submit both spam and non-spam. But we're just trying out with something very simple. And then, of course, there, for these systems as well, there are privacy concerns uh, in implementing them in a distributed way. Um, I mean, so far the the community has really kind of punted on that. Um, you know, there there are techniques you can you can use to fingerprint your packets in such a way that, you know, you sort of hope that things will remain private. But I'm not sure how strong the guarantees are of privacy yet. So privacy is a very important issue um, that, um, you know, it, it is, is very important. And uh, I, I, the, I, I don't really have any good ideas yet for it. And I'm not sure of... Uh, I, I don't really know of, of uh, many techniques that have been proposed for making these types of systems private, for, for, for protecting privacy for these systems, which are much better than um, uh, using, when you're taking fingerprints of, of substrings, using uh, um, hash functions, which are difficult to convert. Okay, so then the third problem that we're interested in is uh, the spectral decomposition problem. This is just a fancy way of saying computing the uh, the eigenvectors of a matrix. Um, so in this problem, we envision each peer having a column of a matrix M. So the column could be, for example, the maybe the peer has owns a web page, and the column represents um, all of the web pages that that peer points to. All right. And of course, this matrix M would be quite sparse because we know that the, the web graph is sparse um, in this case. And the output of the net computer for this problem is to give each peer information on the spectral decomposition of M. So the simplest way to state this problem is, say, the first eigenvector. You know, The output could be that each peer learns the first eigenvector of the matrix M. However, if you wanted to do that, you would be receiving potentially a large number of information, a large amount of, of bits. So if you really wanted things to be completely scalable, 
you would probably want to specify that each peer receives some parts of the first eigenvector. And those parts could be something that would be specified in the input, you know, so indices 5 through 25 or something of the, the first eigenvector. And applications of this are uh, the eigentrust system, um, the uh, collaborative filtering applications, and things like PageRank. Um, I'll make use of, of uh, um, eigenvectors of uh, very large matrices like this. OK. So any questions about these general problems before I go on? So now I'm going to talk more about um, our preliminary work, so how we, we built sort of this first special purpose net computer for the uh, Byzantine agreement problem. OK. Well, here's the, the general approach that we've used for this, this uh, our, our first net computer that we built. Um, basically elect what we call uh, representative committees. And these committees are representative in the sense that they have the same fraction of bad peers in them, in other words, peers that are controlled by the adversary, as the number of bad peers in the general population. Okay. And these are basically the gates of the net computer. And creating these representative committees, we create them in like this dynamic sense and that's sort of a lot of the technical difficulty of, of our result, is, is essentially figuring out how to, to create them dynamically. Now note that if you, if you create, if you had these committees that you set up, you know, at the very beginning of the algorithm, they were, they were uh, um, uh, if you set them up statically and they were small, it'd be very easy for the, the adversary to just take over, you know, a large number of the committees. Um, and if they're, they're large, they can't really function as gates because we're going to, the thing that we're going to be doing with the committees is we're going to be using them essentially as um, functional units. They're all going to sort of cooperate to do one thing together. So we want them to be very small. So in order for them to be, to be small, they need to be chosen dynamically because if they were chosen, if they were both small and chosen statically, it would be very easy for the adversary to take over a lot of them. All right, so that's sort of one piece of the puzzle. And these are sort of the gates of the net computer. And then the other thing that we will be doing is um, building this uh, distributed uh, sort of data structure overlay network, which will connect these gates. So they will um, allow these, um, these small committees to uh, communicate with each other. And these this part of the, the system is sort of analogous to wires, to secure wires in that computer. And um, OK, so that's the basic idea. So now I, before I go into the, more of the details of this idea, I just want to state the, the result that we have. Um, so this is the thing that we can prove. If we have n peers, in our original network, and less than a strictly less than a third of them are, one third fraction of them are corrupt. Um, we have an algorithm and a polylogarithmic degree bounded network. So, in other words, this is the overlay network um, that that algorithm runs on that achieves the, the following properties. So, first of all, um, it solves the Byzantine agreement problem for not every peer in the network, but almost every peer in the network. Okay? So, one thing to notice here is that if each peer is only connected to this polylogarithmic number of other peers in the network, and the adversary is able to take over a one-third fraction of the peers, you're not going to be able to guarantee that every peer in the, in the network is going to, to get the right answer. Because the adversary could, um, can easily pick you know, one good peer and then just take over all of its neighbors thereby isolating that peer completely from the rest of the network. So the best type of result you're going to be able to get is something of, of this type, where you let not everyone know the correct result, but you let all but, um, you can read this as a uh, vanishingly small fraction of the peers know the right result. This, this is a number that goes to 0 as, as n gets large. 
Okay. So that's that's the the most important part of the result, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, incorporated in this is the attack resistance because uh, result because uh, um, you know Byzantine agreement essentially. Well, I'm sorry, incorporated into this. You know, we're, we're assuming that we have one third of the peers being controlled by the adversary. Um, and in spite of that, we're able to do this. And then this is the scalability um, result. Each of the peers is sending and processing only a polylogarithmic poly number of bits, and that's in the number of peers in the network originally. And uh, finally, the, the latency itself is also polylogarithmic. And this entire result is on a, on a static network. Um, and it's, it's also a static attack. So the adversary is assumed to take over a one-third fraction of appears in the network at the very beginning of the, after seeing the algorithm in the network and so forth. But, but that's it. it. It can't keep on taking over appears in the network. Um, and this is, as I said, is, is sort of preliminary work in the sense that um, uh, the network is assumed to be static here. Um, so it's it's not really a, a real peer-to-peer -peer network, and you know we can't really deal with peers joining and leaving the network um, uh, over time, you know, in, a, in any real-world sense. And um, uh, at this point, um, this the polylogarithmic and n uh, here these these bounds are are not practical. So we're we're um, the the constants are are too large to uh, be something that would, you know, that we would want to implement and and um, um, and deploy, um, but this is this is an area that we're actually currently working on, um, in reducing the uh, the hidden constants, um, in this this resource cost. And we we actually believe we we've made some some good progress already in doing this, and we we believe that we can we can get things to to a point where it would start to to be practical for the Byzantine agreement result. Okay, so let me put the Byzantine agreement result in some, some context. Um, so all, to the best of our knowledge, all of the past results on, on Byzantine agreement require at least one resource cost, which is not to be not scalable. So they require um, a linear number of, of, uh, of, of messages and, and therefore bits to be sent and, and received by each peer. There is some interesting result uh, work that has been done in doing Byzantine agreement on a sparse network, well, where this is basically each each peer has you know just a polylogarithmic number of neighbors, and that's by um, Upfall and some other um, some other people. Um, this is this sort this is the state of the art though. Um, uh, this uh, Upfall's ninety two result, um, which basically uh, achieves Byzantine agreement. Um, for all but a, a vanishingly small fraction of the, the peers in the network. Um, but it requires a linear number of messages per peer um, still. So even though each, each peer is just assumed to have a small number of neighbors, it's still, each peer is still sending out a very large number of messages. And, um, you know, in comparison um, with, with this result uh, and all the other previous Byzantine re agreement results, there, we, this is a, a, you know, one thing that I think is, is sort of cool about our result is that we are actually getting, you know, an exponential improvement. So going down from linear to polylogarithmic is a, asymptotically, it's, it's a very significant um, improvement. Um, so that's, that's basically how things fit into, um, the, how our, our result fits into the sort of past Byzantine agreement results in the, the theory community, at least. And again, you know, I want to point out that if if you want things to be scalable, and you want the, if you want things to be scalable, you're going to have to have the peers be connected in a sparse network. And if you do that, you can only assure ensure this almost everywhere component. In other words, that um, every peer learns the correct output, except for this uh, vanishingly small fraction of the peers. Okay, so now let me go into some of the details of our result. And, uh, oh, 
No, oh, I don't have much time. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so let me let me sort of briefly um, go through some of the, the uh, details of our result. So the first uh, key idea is to um, to create these uh, representative committees, and uh, remember I said that we want to create them dynamically because we want them to be both small and representative. So to do that, we use this this concept of an election graph, and we basically um, the peers in the network are going to sort of start at the uh, the bottom of this election graph, and they make their way up by winning subelections, and each subelection will take place among a subset of the peers, and the the subelections will basically be to determine which peers advance in this graph. That'll be decided by, for example, having the participating peers flip coins. And it turns out we need to do something a little bit more complicated, but um, it's 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 not the complication is is not um, uh, not it's just a detail. Okay, so a naive way. So essentially, what'll happen is just to sort of. Uh, peek ahead here. We're going to have um, all of the peers in the network will sort of be um, at this at the bottom of this uh, election graph, and the election graph will just be this kind of conceptual thing, basically, um, that uh, will eventually get us at the top a um, a, rep a small representative uh, subcommittee, and the small representative subcommittee will. Um, do the uh, actual computation for us, the Byzantine Agreement computation. And then most of the committees that, and, and then each one of these, these internal nodes in the, in the election graph will consist of uh, a small committee. And most of them, all but a vanishingly small fraction, um, will, be, uh, will be representative. They will not have too many bad peers in them. And so um, they will. The, the communication will basically go from here sort of back down again. And um, uh, these, these nodes will sort of act as, as, as gates in some sense, and the, the links between them will act as wires. And uh, this, the representative community we have at the very top here will in some sense be a kind of CPU. I mean, it will be doing like the actual um, computation for us. Okay, so. You know, then, then this is this is sort of a picture of kind of a naive case where we would just have, um, we would basically just have like this kind of tournament type structure where we would be electing the uh, um, uh, the uh, the representative subcommittee in this way. But the bad thing here is that you could have uh, one bad peer like this peer here, A, which is red, and all the other blue peers are good, and it can just cheat. Um, at each one of the, uh, the sub-elections that are occurring. And if, the, if you just have a, a tree-like structure, um, it's very easy for just a single peer to cheat and repeatedly and make its way up to the top. OK, so that's basically what this slide says. Okay, so that's the problem with a, um, a tree-type election structure. So instead of, of that, we use, we create this um, new type of election graph, which is sort of a, a new robust type uh, graph. And we use three different approach, approaches to do that. Um, first, we have several peers at each one of the leaf nodes in our tournament graph. And then we have several winners of each one of the sub-elections that are occurring at, each, at every internal node. And then we have um, the layers of the election graph are connected by an expander-like bipartite graph. And expanders are, are just sort of a, a fancy uh, graph theoretic tool that that we make, make use of um, that I'm not going to really describe in detail. But the details of it are, are in our paper. So here's, here's sort of a picture of that's captures some of these, that captures these three key concepts and how we, we use them to create um, a robust uh, version of the election graph. So here you can see we've got two bad peers, uh, B and A. And each of them is starting out at a certain number of um, leaf nodes, I guess at three leaf nodes each peer starts at. And where e the leaf nodes that each peer is, starts at is that's determined at the very beginning of the algorithm. Every, it's part of the algorithm, and the adversary is 
knows knows what that information, we assume. And then each, there's a, a link between two nodes here that basically all of these peers participate in the election that's occurring here. So essentially there's, this election consists of these guys, these guys, these guys, and these guys. And all of them compete according to some election. In the simplest case you can imagine this is just, you know, they flip coins together to decide who gets to advance. And then these are the winners. And so this, this represents a, 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 one of these committees that I was talking about. You can see this is representative, and this, and this, and, and that. I mean, they, they don't have too many bad peers in them, in this example. Um, and uh, basically, this is the, uh, you know, the final committee that, that is elected in this example. OK, so the, I've, I've told you kind of the basics of, of our approach. Um, you know, we really, to create these, these committees, we really make use of um, the idea of, of doing elections and um, this uh, robust type of, of tournament graph. But this is not all of the problem. I mean, just, just being able to specify a tournament graph which is robust is really just kind of the start of solving this problem. Um, so there, first of all, the first major problem that we ran into is communication problems. So basically, a peer which is competing in some sub-election needs to be able to communicate with the other peers in the, in the sub-election with it. Why is this hard? Well, the peer that's, com that's competing in that sub-election needs to find out which other peers are competing at that sub-election. But that peer is unlikely to have direct links to its competitors. So for example, remember, each peer just knows about a polylogarithmic number of other nodes in the network. So if you're this peer D and you've, you've gotten very lucky and you've advanced up to this point in the election graph, you don't know any of the, the peers um, necessarily that are below you here. Um, so you need to find out information about who you should be competing with in order to, to, um, to, uh, to actually run the election. And every peer that's, that's participating in the election needs to get that information. You didn't even dis, uh, define the election rule. How, how, how do I know which one should be elected? Sorry. The, the previous graph? Yes. The graph here, I don't even understand what's the rule you, you do the election and how you advance each one you, you choose uh, as a committee. Okay, so... Um, so in the simplest case, you could just imagine that um, each peer that's participating in the election um, just flips a coin. Imagine there are two peers that are participating. Um, and if the, if the parity is odd of those two coin flips, then um, the first peer advances. If it's, if it's uh, even, then the second peer advances. Now, we don't use that, that particular rule for the elections, but we use something along those lines. So there, it, there's just a, a distributed... Um, uh, protocol for um, deciding who gets to advance. We actually wind up using something which is a little bit more complicated so that we can tolerate a certain fraction of the peers being bad. If, if there's a small fraction of the peers bad, we can convince. This one, then if you by flip the coin, how could you statistically guarantee the final you elected doesn't contain any bad note? I, I don't understand that part. What, what's your guarantee for, for this one? Um, so as, as I said, if you um, we don't we don't just we don't simply use something where the the um, uh, um, where they where the, the two peers that are competing flip a coin. Um, we use something which is which is a bit more complicated than that, but it's it's the same sort of idea. I mean, you you, you have a, a, the group together that wants to hold a, an election amongst themselves. They they use some um, each of them uh, makes this random choice. And then based on those, those random choices that each peer makes, there's, there's a decision about which, which peer gets to advance. And the details of this are, are in our paper. Okay. So, so on, from, on. from this graph, I don't know which part, you know, guarantee there's a no bad node um, um, get elected at the top level. No so it's always just uh, for this, this particular graph, you, you elect uh, GDF as a the representative, always a, in a general way to guarantee 100%, okay, in my algorithm, 
no bad note kind of no, no, you shouldn't. I mean, the graph doesn't talk at all about the elections. It's just it, about how the elections occurred each node. It only talks about how the the um, the tournament structure is. is There's great. no way to make that guarantee, by the way, because that could be a bad node. Yeah. <laughs> They've been perfectly, reasonably doing everything right, and therefore get elected. Yeah, that's, that's so exactly. The only guarantee you can make is that the committees are representative. So, that, so that when you get to the top, at that point, you can run a Byzantine fault tolerance algorithm on that small group of nodes and tolerate the fact that some small fraction of them are corrupt. What you're trying to avoid is the is the corrupt hosts, you know, uh, basically um, ganging up on the other ones and, and, and you know. So but, but I, I, I'm right out of time, so why don't I just, I, I, there's some, some additional things I, I want to make sure that I get across, so why don't I just quickly go through this and then we can take some questions. Um, Okay, so, so the communication problems was one of the sort of major issues that we needed to deal with um, in order to basically need to figure out which, which peers are competing at, at each one of the sub-elections. Um, and the problem here is, is that the peers are unlikely to have direct links to their competitors. Um, the solution that we, we have is to create this the static network, which is basically the, the overlay network for a system. And this topology is based on the election graph topology. Each node A in this in the election graph has a corresponding static node, which we call S of A, in the uh, static network. And the purpose of the node S of A is basically to work as a, a relay station for the election that's occurring at the the, um, the node A the election network. Here's a little picture of this. So here's our um, here's that particular election graph that I put up a while ago, and this is just a blow up of on this portion of it. So here's the node A, and you've got all these links down here, and these are the four of the nodes that are competing in the election at A, uh, E, C, D, and A. And basically, the static network, this is, you can think of this as sort of, you know, again, part of the, the wires that of the net computer that enable the secure um, communication to occur. So it's set up in such a way that um, almost all of the the, um, the peers in the network are able to communicate securely amongst themselves, and so they're they're able to um, almost all of the peers are able to uh, to um, participate in, in uh, the elections. Whereby almost all, I mean all, but a, a, a vanishingly small fraction, as I guess large. So that's the the one tool that we came up with for this. Um, and these, these are just some of the details of the static network, um, which I don't think I'm going to go into for lack of time. Um, a, another interesting problem, this is sort of the last problem that I wanted to talk about, is um, a denial of service type attack. Um, I think this is very interesting because I'm not aware of any theoretical results at all that really um, uh, deal with this type of attack. And in some sense, our, our model forces us to deal with it. Um, so the, the because each peer can only send a polylogarithmic only send and process a polylogarithmic number of messages. So here's here's the problem: uh, the corrupt peers can wait until the until near the end of the election, find out you know see which which are the good peers that are about to win, and then uh, simply flood those mess those peers with messages, flood the neighbors of those peers with messages, for example, and then just cut them off from the, the network. So because we assume that each peer can only process polylog and messages, we need to be able to handle this. And our solution is this idea of permissible paths. So basically, we, we, these are dynamically determined paths that um, peers are allowed to send along. So a peer is only allowed to send messages along paths where it has already won sub-elections. So this prevents the corrupt peers from sending spurious messages, sending too many messages to peers that have advanced far in the election. They can send spurious messages to all their neighbors and thereby perhaps knock out their neighbors, but those messages won't be forwarded along. Um, so that's, that's the basic idea for dealing with that. And you know, this picture doesn't really give too much of the detail, except you know, here this is sort of an example of the web paths are, are the, um, if you didn't use this concept of permissible paths, uh, um, you could see this pair D would just be receiving a large number of messages and thereby would be knocked out from the network. And uh, you know, this is the type of thing that you might get with permissible paths. And then there's a dissemination problem. Um, 
Uh, I think I'm going to skip over that for lack of time. Um, the results again are in our paper. And the analysis, I believe I will also skip over for lack of time. Um, essentially, uh, you know, again, the details of this are, are in our paper. Um, the concepts that we're, we make use of very frequently are um, we use the probabilistic method to, um, to create to, to show that certain types of graphs, graph structures that we create, um, have uh, um, properties which, which ba basically make them, make them uh, useful for uh, uh, communication, um, even in the case where the average takes over a certain fraction of the nodes in the network. Okay, so, so these are the, yeah, so so this, those are the. The, the, um, the details that are in the paper, as I said. Okay, so let me just finish up with um, some areas for future work because I think this is, this is sort of important. Um, you know, first I should say that, uh, again, this is very preliminary work in the sense that it's a very interesting theoretical result um, and, you know, that's, that's great, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done in, in making it practical and that involves simplifying protocols and reducing the constants. Um, we initially did not even make use of cryptography at all in our protocol, but we, we feel that we can use it to great benefit um, in terms of reducing the resource cost. Um, we would also like to look at the trade-off between efficiency and the number of adversarial peers and um, consider use of some um, outside tools, perhaps, make, make certain additional assumptions to simplify things. Asynchronous communication is something that we, we already actually have some preliminary results on for this problem. So what, everything that I told you before just works in the synchronous model of communication. And um, uh, handling dynamic attacks, you know, this was already mentioned before. This is, I think, very important for making this um, realistic. Um, these are a couple of ideas that, that we have for that. And uh, basically the overlay network that we created um, for, to solve this, for, to create our first net computer, um, this Byzantine agreement type computer, was a very special purpose overlay network. We'd like to use something like cord can tapestry or just a skip graphs or just any sort of overlay network that has some particular type of a property, like the expansion property in particular. And um, say that you know we did, that we can just use that to build our, our net computer on top of. Okay, so then the, those are short-term goals. Then uh, very long-term goals, and this is sort of getting back to the vision, are um, designing these uh, special-purpose net computers for new problems, including frequently occurring strings problem and spectral decomposition. And we have some partial results for the frequently occurring strings problem. Uh, spectral decomposition is much harder, but it, I think a very interesting problem. Um, so that's something that we've just begun to think a little bit about. Um, okay, so handling churn I think is important for this, and heterogeneous networks. And then a very interesting kind of general question is, can we come up with a general purpose net computer so in other words, can we build a net computer that is Turing complete? And we actually know that we can't. Um, there are certain types of, of functions that are sen very sensitive to individual inputs that we can't deal with. Um, but a very interesting problem is to sort of formalize what types of functions can and cannot be handled. Okay, so that ends my talk. Sorry for going over. It's a thank you speaker.